subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. In an open letter due to be published this week, 239 scientists from 32 different countries have written to the World Health Organization asking for a revision of transmission safety recommendations and guidelines for the spread of COVID-19 after recent evidence suggests that it could be an airborne infection. This is according to a report in the New York Times. Airborne transmission, and more specifically aerosol transmission, implies that the virus lingers in the air, especially indoors, and can infect those nearby over a period of time. Whether there is airborne transmission and how much of it occurs has been the subject of much debate. Definitions of what constitutes airborne in airborne transmission vary widely and the term has been used frequently interchangeably with aerosol transmission since the very early days of the outbreak. In this video, we shall take a look at the four main terms being used to describe transmission, airborne, aerosol, droplet and fomite. My name is Sandhya Ramesh and this is Pure Science. We are all familiar with droplet transmission. Droplets are non-microscopic drops of cough or mucus that are expelled from our noses and mouths when we cough, sneeze or laugh. Fomite transmission occurs when cough droplets settle on surfaces and then someone touches a surface that has a droplet on it and then immediately touches their face without washing their hands. It is to prevent fomite transmission that washing of hands with soap is recommended. We'll discuss fomite transmission a little later in this video, but looking at airborne transmission. Airborne transmission occurs when suspended particles of varying sizes, including droplets, are dispersed and spread by air. On the other hand, aerosols are much smaller particles than cough droplets and can pass through most masks other than a secure N95 respirator class of masks. Now, since the beginning of the outbreak, the WHO has maintained that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is not airborne. The Global Health Organization has said that the virus spreads mainly through larger respiratory droplets. They have explained that the risk of aerosolization, where particles smaller than 5 micrometers are released, increases during certain medical procedures. When air is blown at high pressure over a liquid, it can convert liquids into aerosols that can fly around undetected to the naked eye. And the WHO has said that outside of this context, the evidence for aerosol transmission was unclear in real life. Thus, it placed the risk and it continues to place the risk of transmission by aerosols only under certain conditions such as the inside of operating theatres. But evolving analysis of COVID epidemiology seems to suggest that contagious individuals can indeed spread the SARS-CoV-2 virus through airborne transmission much farther than previously estimated and this is likely due to aerosol transmission. Experts are now cautioning that the emerging evidence suggests that aerosol transmission may be more common than we think. This is especially true for environments like meat processing plants which have recently emerged as infection hotspots. According to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the US, the biggest risk to meat packers comes from being in prolonged close proximity to other workers. The temperatures there are very cool inside to prevent the spoiling of meat and additionally, meat processing and packing facilities also have very strong ventilation systems that are mandatorily required there to prevent meat from spoiling or getting contaminated. Colder temperatures can keep the virus alive and stable in the air for longer periods of time and wind currents from ventilation systems can facilitate the movement and dispersal of this virus around indoors inside these meat packing facilities. We have ample evidence of ventilation systems and air conditioning vents spreading the virus inside an enclosed space. Another one of the most widely cited super spreader cases in China was an infected but then asymptomatic individual 
who managed to pass on the virus to nine others in a restaurant selectively, even though over 70 people had dined there that day. Retrospective studies have showed that air currents from an indoor air conditioner carried the virus from the index patient who went to this restaurant to very specific people who were in the path of these air currents, but not to those who were seated right beside these people. And yet another super spreader event was the Washington Choir Group in the US. Analysis showed that one infected choir singer spread the virus to 32 other people and also potentially infected 20 more people from transmission that occurred by aerosolization, which in turn occurred through the process of singing. So, emerging evidence from studying early outbreaks, super spreader events and local clusters have provided several insights into transmission routes. Many studies have also identified airborne transmission as the primary pathway of the spread of the virus. Airborne transmission here includes transmission by both larger droplets dispersed by air as well as aerosols. And this is well established in medical literature before this virus even came along. So let's take a look at the actual measurements of these particulate sizes. A micrometer is one thousandth of a millimeter. Droplets are thought to be anywhere between five and a thousand micrometers in size, while aerosols are considered to be less than five micrometers in diameter. Humans produce respiratory droplets that range from 0.1 micrometer to 1000 micrometers in diameter. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is considered to be approximately 0.1 micrometer in size. Larger particles tend to be heavier and they are thought to spread to shorter distances and settle on surfaces, increasing the risk of fomite transmission, while smaller ones can disperse in the air outdoors and spread much more quickly indoors. It is now thought that the risk of airborne transmission is higher in an indoor setting, which can be mitigated to an extent by extended physical distancing and good ventilation in the space. Furthermore, studies suggest that the risk of aerosolization or atomization occurs not only during surgical procedures, but also from just speech or exhalation or singing, as with the choir group that we saw. Other respiratory diseases causing viruses like the influenza A virus have exhibited evidence of transmission via aerosols. Even the first SARS virus, the SARS-CoV-1 virus from the 2003 outbreak also exhibited aerosol transmission as determined by multiple studies. It's findings like these that have prompted several experts in aerosol transmission to call for a more thorough examination of transmission routes by aerosol of COVID-19. Even aerosol experts equipped from findings from their own areas of expertise are using their findings to back up their argument that the WHO should communicate a higher risk of aerosol transmission than we believe today. The WHO has been sticking to its stance so far. Its most recent advisory on transmission safety stressed on droplet transmission and it was issued on the 29th of June, just about three days after aerosol experts had flagged suspicions of aerosol transmission and stated that the research the WHO was using to stress on transmission through droplets was outdated. In an article published in the journal Science in June, Aerosol researchers alleged that WHO's recommendations are based on research carried out in the 1930s where the technology to study submicron aerosols was unavailable. The authors compared the spread of the virus to that of cigarette smoke in indoor and outdoor settings. They essentially simplified their findings about aerosol transmission and stated that picturing the virus spreading is akin to picturing cigarette smoke spreading in any setting. So wherever the smoke would reach, the virus would reach. However, the WHO's technical lead on infection control, Dr. Benedetta Allegranzi, disagreed with the need to revise safety guidelines. She told the New York Times that the evidence for airborne transmission is not substantive yet. And this is true. 
but authorities who spoke to the New York Times have said that there isn't enough evidence for fomite transmission either. But WHO stresses on washing hands constantly, which is also true. So they question why they are discounting extra precaution around aerosolization and airborne transmission. Dr. Alegranze clarified that the WHO has stated that, that airborne transmission is possible but not yet supported by evidence. This is one of the pitfalls of working on something so new and so urgent. We just do not have enough data. We don't have evidence to support widespread aerosol transmission, but we also don't have evidence to discount widespread aerosol transmission. Viruses can also attach themselves to other aerosol particles, such as those found in polluted areas, to travel even further. Lots of viruses do that already, and we have evidence for this phenomenon since the 1950s. This increases their dispersion as they move with the particles in the air. But the residence time, or how long the virus can remain suspended in the atmosphere, is currently unknown for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Since wind currents disperse particles of all sizes, outdoor locations are considered to be much safer than indoor locations. A revision of guidelines would imply changes in masking policies around the world. Even simple cloth masks can provide protection against droplet transmission today, especially from an infected person, but only masks that can filter out submicron particles, such as the N95 respirator, will be effective against aerosolized transmission. It might also lead to stricter physical distancing measures, especially indoors. But given what we know, and especially what we do not know, it's likely to be safer to be as cautious as possible. Thank you for watching this video.